This is Rewind 105.7 Up Close, and I am Steve Richards, and Greg Kinn is my guest. Greg, fondly remembered as an 80s music icon for his two catchy chart-topping hits, the breakup song, They Don't Write Them, in 81, and the 83 smash single, Jeopardy, which charted number two on the Billboard Top 100. He was first signed in 1973 to the now-legendary record label, Berserkly Records, Greg's groundbreaking video for Jeopardy became one of the first concept videos and was played extensively on MTV during the early days. Greg Ken Band also spent much of the 80s touring with the likes of Journey, The Stones, Grateful Dead, and appearing on popular TV shows including Solid Gold, American Bandstand, and Saturday Night Live. He also spent some time on this side of the microphone, successful 16-year career as a top-rated DJ out in San Jose, California is also an accomplished author, having written six well-received novels and numerous short stories, along with two screenplays. He and his band still tour extensively throughout the U.S., including a date in Buffalo coming up on July 29th. He has a brand new album out. It's called Rekindled. It was released back in March of this year, and Greg joins me now. Welcome. Welcome. Hey, Steve. Thanks for having me on the show. That was a heck of an introduction. I mean, I don't think we even need need to do the interview now. That was a lot of information. That covered it all, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know what? Uh, Of all the things I do, and I mean, you know, I do a lot of things in my life, but I love playing live the most. I love, I got my band out there. We're we're out there touring this summer, we've got dates all over the country, including, as you pointed out, one coming up in Buffalo. And the fact that, uh, you know, it, I'm telling you, it's liberating. After all those years, I was uh, was 18 years doing the morning show on KFOX, which, as you know, as a radio guy, it's it's a toughie because you got to get up at 4 a.m., getting up yeah. at 4 a.m. for 20 years in a row will change a guy. <laughs> Oh, I was yeah. used to going to bed at 4 a.m. and uh, <laughs> not getting up at 4 a.m. Anyway, uh, then uh, uh, Case Fox and me parted ways a couple of years ago, and suddenly I had all this wonderful time on my hands. So uh, I, <laughs> what could I say? I made an album. I wrote a, I wrote a novel, and uh, I reformed the band, and we're hitting the road. And you know, it's a, it's been an exciting time, man. Yeah, Craig, let's start there with the reforming of the band. So your son is in the band, right, Ryken? Yeah, Ryken, by the way, he was named after Ry Cooter when, when he was a baby. Mm. Uh, Ry is an unbelievable guitarist, and he was a former student of Joe Satriani when Joe was in the band. A lot of people don't know this one. In the early days, Joe did uh, um, guitar lessons, believe it or not. He, a lot of the, uh, like uh, Kirk Hammett from uh, Metallica and a lot of the guys in in uh, Bay Area bands all took lessons from Joe. And he was kind of like the guru. And he was in a band called The Squares. And I'd asked him to join a couple of times, uh, and it wasn't until The Squares broke up around, I guess, 86, 87, that he joined the band proper, the Greg Kin Band, uh, and then my son, who was a teenager at the time, starts taking lessons with Joe. And from there, he went to uh, uh, Berkeley School of Music in Boston. And then uh, he graduated a uh, jazz guitar major from Cal Arts in L.A. And that kid can play anything. He is unbelievable. And I got a new uh, drummer. It's actually, it's um, it's Sammy Hagar's drummer. Sammy's an old buddy of mine. And... Uh, I ran into him. He said, "Hey, look, uh, I, I don't. My drummer can't tour this this uh, summer. He goes, well, why don't you make, take my guy, Dave Lowser? He's a great drummer. He's not doing anything because Sammy had chicken foot all summer, and then some other project in the fall. So he said, I'm not going to use the guy for a, at least a year. So why don't you take him on the road? So we rehearsed with uh, Dave, and it turns out he was an unbelievably great drummer. It just Kind of like a Keith Moon guy, you know, real busy, a lot of fills, really exciting. And uh, and then we've got uh, Robert Barry, who is now the Greg Kin Band producer on the bass and uh, playing the studio. So we've been rehearsing. We've been playing out there in the world. We've already played a couple of dates, and it's wonderful. 
It's just wonderful to be out on stage again. That's probably my, these are my main, my favorite moments. Chatting with Greg Ken here on uh, Rewind Up Close here, Rewind 105.7, rewind1057.com. I mentioned the Buffalo date. That's the closest uh, to Albany here on July 29th. Do you remember playing here in Albany? Any, any memories of Albany? Uh, gee, I know we, we played there a couple of times back in the 80s. Um, and, you know, we in upper state New York was always a good spot for us. We yeah. played a lot of, a lot of those towns. Uh, I don't have any specific memories of, uh, of Albany, but, uh, I, I remember being there. I remember really, you know, the people in upstate New York really loved the Greg Kin band. I don't know whether we touched a nerve or whether it was Weird Al doing, uh, Jeopardy, but for some reason people loved us up there. And, uh, I'm hoping to, we're, if you go to the gregkin.com website, you can find uh, there's a section of tour dates, and we're adding. We've got a new booking agent, and we're adding tour dates all the time. So periodically, go back and check those tour dates because I'm positive there'll be more uh, in in uh, northern New York. So just uh, keep checking. Yeah, hopefully we can get you guys uh, back here to the uh, Capital Region, too, here in Albany. Hey, I wanted to ask you about that uh, Weird Al parody. What did you think of that when it first came out? Oh, man. First of all, I was really flattered that he did that. When he called, you know, he's got to call and get permission if he's going to do a, a parody of your song. Uh, and, of course, you know, he called me out of the clear blue sky, and he had a brilliant idea for the song, which is I lost on Jeopardy. Yeah. You, know, I, you know, it was a great idea. So I was really flattered, and I thanked him for it. And I asked him, you know, has anyone ever turned you down? You know, Weird Al, you, you're, you're the king of parodies. He goes, yeah, and in all of these years, everybody said yes except for one guy, Prince. Prince would not let him do a Purple Rain parody, which he had prepared. But uh, I guess the guy was taking himself a lot more seriously than the rest of us. And, uh, he, you know, he poo-pooed that whole project. But I personally, I was flattered. And I... It, it means that if you're well enough to be parodying, uh, that's good. And uh, also, I got to tell you, I got to this day, I still get mailbox money from Weird Al. I mean, God bless him. <laughs> you know, he put that, I lost on Jeopardy, was on his triple platinum uh, Weird Al's Greatest Hits album. Yeah. And like I said before, it's generated a lot of mailbox money. And I got to say, that song put both of my kids through college. <laughs> We're chatting with Greg Ken here on Rewind 105.7. Hey, give me a memory of touring with the Stones and a memory of touring with the Grateful Dead. What was that like? Oh, well, the, first of all, the Grateful Dead were, was a, uh, they were a Bay Area band, and we were yeah. a Bay Area band. And, and most of those were Bill Graham shows. And Bill always had a little flair, you know. I, he just didn't do anything normally. And we played, a, I remember we played a play, uh, Spartan Stadium, which is San, San Jose State's stadium. Seats 80,000 people. I mean, it was packed. 80,000 people. Um, and we were part of a three, it was the Grateful Dead, Charlie Daniels, and the Dead Kin Band. And uh, we go out there, and I remember because backstage, Bill had erected this huge Moroccan tent so the whole backstage area was like Morocco. And in the tent, it was like pillows and rugs and everything, so you could just sit on the floor. There was a giant hookah in the middle of the floor. <laughs> I mean, this thing was five feet tall, and it had multiple stems. And it thing was billowing smoke. And I walked into the, into the Moroccan tent, and there's Jerry Garcia in with a with a smoke cloud around his head, you could barely see him. <laughs> and I'm and Mickey Hart says, "Here, sit down and have a couple of hits with us." <laughs> and I figured, hey, I'm a tough guy. I'm a you know, I'm a Bay Area guy. I can handle this. Well, ten minutes of smoking with the Grateful Dead. I didn't know what planet I was on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then great. the guy comes in. He goes, five minutes, Mister Kid." I go, five minutes to what?" He goes, this is a gig. You're at a gig. you got to play. And I'm like, oh, my God. 
It was one of the few times in my life I've actually been too high to play. <laughs> and when we walked out on stage, we had several hits. You know, we had Breakup Song and Jeopardy. We go and do our hits. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> uh, we And then we, I said, well, let's just, let's just jam. So we did a 20-minute version of Johnny Be Good, uh, just all, all improv, and we got a standing ovation. And they went nuts. <laughs> so we do our hits, nothing. We do an improv of, of, of Chuck Berry, boom, we get a standing O. Mm. So I learned the, a major lesson that day. When you're, way, when you're playing with the, with the dead, just leave your hits at home and just jam, you know? Yeah. How about the Stones? Oh, the Stones were great. I mean, first of all, uh, my mom was adamant that every time we played a Bill Graham gig, uh, she would tell, she would tell me to go and thank Bill Graham personally for the gig. So you know, one day he calls me up, and Prince was the opening band. It was Prince, Jake Isles, and the Stones, and they played the L.A. Forum a couple of nights before that. And Prince took off his pants and was traipsing around the stage in a thong, and and it was too much. And uh, so the the Stones said, "Hey, look, there's only one for you know room for one sex symbol on this tour, and it ain't you, fella." Hmm. So they uh, they fired Prince after two gigs, and uh, Bill Graham called me up and he goes, "Hey, could you be in Seattle to open for the Stones tomorrow night by seven o'clock?" I said, absolutely, I'll be there. It was the thrill of a lifetime, and I remember playing the gig. We did well. We, that was a huge, it was at Seattle Kingdom, uh, probably 90,000 people a show. We did a couple of shows. And after it was over, they took me in to, to meet the Stones, and uh, Bill Graham introduces me around, and I'm sitting there on the couch, and uh, I'm sitting between uh, Jerry Hall and Mick Jagger, oh. and uh, Charlie Watts is sitting directly across from me, and I'm having a nice conversation with Charlie Watts about how you go out there and you play these huge gigs like they're little clubs, and you don't try to overplay them and overplay, and that's the key to you know the Stones that they always played it like it was a little club, and uh, you know I said, well, it's, it's easy for you to say you're in the Stones. I mean, come on. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, they're all smoking like a chimney. This was in the days when I was a smoker and, uh, they all had their own packs of cigarettes. And I asked Mick Jagger, I bummed a cigarette for Mick Jagger. I said, hey, Mick, could you a spare cigarette? I felt like a heel, but you know, they were all puffing away. So he says, here, man, have the whole pack. It gives me a pack of Marlboros. I found out later that each guy in the band had a carton of cigarettes just for him. So it was no big. He just opened another pack. But he gave me their, the pack of Marlboros. I went back to my dressing room. My guys are hating me because I got to meet the Stones, and they didn't. And then I whipped it out. I go, but look, I've got Mick Jagger's sacred cigarettes. The sacred and my Marlboros. Guys are like, oh, God, i got to have one. So they all jumped on them. Smoked them like they were joints, so it was just sucking them up, and it was just, it was great. They loved it, and I gave the the few remaining cigarettes to my uh, uh, guitar player Gary Phillips, and then we went out on the road with Journey, and somebody was uh, babysitting his house, and they smoked all the cigarettes. When they found the Mick Jagger cigarettes on his mantle, they just assumed it was a pack of Marlboros and smoked it, and when. And Gary got back. He was very upset. But uh, a little in vignette about the Stones, and they were super nice, by the way. Yeah. All right, let's fast forward to today. We're talking to Greg Ken here on Rewind 105.7. You've got a new album out. It came out in uh, March of this year. I love the title, Rekindled. Yeah, you know, we're never going to run out of those Greg Kinn puns. Yeah. And my mother, I remember when she was alive, she told me, she said, you know, Greg, every time I go to the uh, supermarket, people walk up to me and they start spouting off these album titles. You know, because I, I named like 18 or 20 of them over the years. And there was like Rekindled, uh, there was Consolidation, Conspiracy, you know, on and on. And my mother said, you know, that was an early form of branding. 
because every suddenly everybody knew the kid name. Yeah. And I never thought when I was a kid that there were so many puns. But here we are. We're still doing it. In fact, I've been in the studio working on the next album, and we're already trying to figure out what that's going to be called. How do, uh, what are your thoughts on this album? How does it feel? I love it. You know, this was uh, it was a it was a labor of love to make it. Uh, we did it in uh, Sound Tech Studios in Campbell, California, which is just down the road from my house. And uh, uh, Robert Berry produced it. Uh, it was just, it was a labor of love. Like we would go in there literally in the morning, we kick around a song idea. And by two or three o'clock in the afternoon, we'd already written the song and we were cutting the tracks. And by six o'clock, we'd already cut the lead vocal. And it was very easy and painless. Um, you know, my over, over the years, my personal experience is the great songs write themselves you know, Jeopardy and the Breakup Song were both written in about 15 minutes, and they just kind of wrote themselves, you know. They were, the, the lyrics just kind of floated around in the air. I just snatched them and, and, uh, and wrote them down. So when we did uh, Pink Flamingos, which was the first song recorded on the new album and one of my favorites, we did it that, that way. By 6 o'clock, we had a finished song, and the whole album was like that. We would just go in there. It was a labor of love. It, I know from experience that when you really work hard on a song and it takes three weeks and you keep redoing it, it's not going to be a good song. But the stuff that you uh, that writes itself, those are the great ones. So, And this entire album just wrote itself. And it was a pleasure to be in the studio. In fact, we're already working on the next album, so I'm really excited. Yeah, the new album, again, is called Rekindle by Greg Ken. It uh, came out in March of this year. Last thing I wanted to touch on with you, Greg, is your writing. Um, any any new books coming out? Any new books in the works? Uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked me that. Uh, actually, I do. I have, uh, I'm have. i working on... Uh, I've got a trilogy of, 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 saw, of, of books that I wrote called uh, Rubber Soul was the first one. The second one was Painted Black. And the third one's called Anarchy. And uh, it's this guy, Dustin Bob. I met this guy, you know, I had, uh, in my years of radio, uh, I was uh, privy to in- interview the, the, uh, the Beatles uh, over the years. I talked to Ringo Starr a couple times, Paul McCartney a couple times, Pete Best a couple of times. And I asked him, you know, where did the Beatles get their songs, you know, in the early days? How did they get a copy of Twist and Shout, for instance, of the Isley Brothers? It was not released in Europe, and they, there were no uh, import record stores. And he goes, oh, no, we all had friends that were merchant marines. And these guys would come back from New York and Baltimore back to Liverpool, and they'd bring these stacks of records back. And a lot of the stuff would wind up in second-hand stores and in flea markets, and that's where the Beatles came along. And they they found this guy, Dustin Bob, who was a guy the same age as the Beatles who loved the music and kept turning them on to all their cover songs, which they needed five sets of when they got to Hamburg. They needed a ton of material. And, of course, uh, at the end of the novel, he uh, he saves their lives in an assassination attempt in Manila in 1967. Mm. So the next book is due out, what, next year? Yeah, uh, well, you know, I'll probably be finished around uh, you know, around the uh, first of the year. So I would think probably in the spring, they, you know, because it takes them a little while to get it all together. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that. And I, I got another one in the can, so I can, you know, I'm 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 loaded for bear, man. Yeah, cranking it out both with the books and the albums too. Again, the new album is rekindled, and uh, again, Greg Ken will be in Buffalo on July 29th. Hey, Greg, thanks so much for joining me. Hey, it's been my pleasure, and thanks for having me. And I'll see you guys uh, when I'm in your uh, neck of the woods. And uh, I'm looking forward to coming up there and playing sometime soon. All right, same here. And by the way, you can get more info on Greg Ken at gregkin.com. He's got a blog there, too, and on Facebook also at facebook.com slash gregkin. This is Rewind 105.7.